customers like you will have personal assistants. Now in the future, maybe this interview would be generated. <laughs> you never know. Uh, well, like uh, you never we know have a big setup here today yeah. for this. You never know whether <laughs> even this is uh, in a setup. And you and me won't be here. There may be like <laughs> chatbots. Hi Rajiv, it's uh, fantastic to meet you today. One of the most remarkable days that we could have met and be talking about AI and machine learning. Almost shaken up the whole world. It has, hasn't it? You know, there's this old saying in tech which you might have heard that, you know, there are decades where it seems nothing happens. And then there are weeks where decades happen. Right. And the last few weeks and months has seemed like decades, at least to me, I don't know how you feel about it. You're absolutely right. You know, in 2012, at the NeurIPS conference, Jeff Hinton and his students had announced their benchmark for ImageNet using deep learning models, and especially a very specific technique called dropout, randomly zeroed out output of neurons. And it gave a huge step improvement on the ImageNet benchmark, where people, computer vision researchers, benchmark their computer vision algorithms. And that just unleashed deep learning, right? The power of deep learning. It just got a whole lot of interest. In some way, that even laid the foundation for what we are seeing today with large language models and chat GPT, because deep learning is at the core of this another massive inflection point, I think. No, absolutely. In fact, uh, ImageNet, I know, blew the uh, every other result out of the water at that time. Right. And Jeffrey Hinton, by the way, is my personal guru. Besides, obviously, he kind of studied the brain for 10 years, created the whole concept of neural networks. And a right. lot of his students are in the news these days, sometimes for good, sometimes for others. Uh, Jeffrey Hinton obviously has is a famous man. He has his own Wikipedia page. I believe you two have one. So, right. you know, besides the Wikipedia page, which I'm sure everyone can uh, go and uh, look at, it would be great to know a little bit more about you, uh, Rajiv, uh, you, not only your Amazon life, but otherwise? I started my career in research. So I finished my PhD in uh, computer science from the University of Texas at Austin. Mm -hmm. and my dissertation, believe it or not, was on transaction management in databases, so distributed uh, transactions. After I finished my PhD, I just decided I'm not going to look at that area again. <laughs> and I went on to do a lot of other things. Data mining was one area that I got very involved in, main memory databases and so on. And I started my research career at Bell Labs. I was mm. me mentioning to you, mm. it was like the you know, mecca of innovation, where Absolutely. you had inventions like the transistor, the laser, cell phones, cellular phones. And in, you know, when you come to computer science, Unix, C, C++, they were all invented at Bell Labs. So it was a great experience to be amidst innovators like that and people of that caliber. And after Bell Labs, I uh, moved to Yahoo. That was another great experience because from a telecom company, I moved to a internet company, a web company. Yahoo was also a great experience because I went from the telecom domain where I was being pushed more into the physical layer, understanding how wireless networks work, and moved more into the, like the application layer, mm. internet, where mm. all mm. the action was happening. So that was a great transition. But even at Yahoo, I wouldn't say that the path to impact from research was very well thought out or well established. So a lot of the work we did, again, didn't quite impact products, but it was cutting edge work on the web mm -hmm. and the internet. I uh, just wanted to interject and, sure. uh, you know, while you were at Yahoo, I was at MSN. And so I think we are really go back to that vintage, don't we? Right. Um, and, and you were talking about, you know, all your research and then moving here to, uh, uh, to Amazon to head uh, machine learning. And, you know, as we know, while ChatGPT came just a year back and created this explosion, artificial intelligence or machine learning is a 50, 60 year old right. uh, technology. You know, it's been there. Uh, Andrew Wang called it like the new electricity. And he said that, you know, just like you only know about, you don't, yeah. you only think about electricity when it's not there. Right. So we never used to think about AI and ML, you know, until right. these generative models came in, etc. So I just wanted to deep dive into that if it may. And I thought since Amazon is so huge, let me un unpack this 
and perhaps ask you in three different ways. And the first one, you know, how you think machine learning has been helping sellers on the platform? We have over uh, 1.4 million sellers mm -hmm. on our platform here in India. Uh, that is a, a large number. And pain points that we've heard a lot from sellers is listing on our, on our marketplace is really uh, tedious, cumbersome. You know, sellers need to input 150 attributes for each ASIN. Each product, we call products ASINs in Amazon. And it can take an hour or two per product. Wow. And you know we have hundreds of millions of products on our marketplace. So just imagine the amount of time that and effort that goes into listing products, right? And this is a perfect application for Gen AI and large language models, mm. simplifying the listing process for sellers. So we want to make that experience so simple that sellers just need to upload a product image and a few descriptive keywords about the product. And we will use large language models to extract attribute from the product image and those uh, keywords and populate an entire listing, a high quality listing with title, descriptions, bullet points, and also all the attribute values. Mm. So for example, you can imagine from a product image, you can easily infer the color of the shirt. Infer what's the collar type. Is this a half sleeve or a full sleeve shirt? A lot of information is already captured in the image. So by just having sellers upload the image and populate all these attributes, we will just reduce the effort that it takes sellers to list products on our platform. And this is very relevant to India where we don't have the tools, and sellers are new. So making it easy for sellers to list products on our platform is super important. Where sellers can ask questions about you know, various compliance regulations. Uh, sellers can get advice and guidance on how they grow their business, maybe through offering deals and uh, advertising and so on. So again, this is something should be very beneficial to sellers in emerging markets like India. That's fantastic. Um, you know, it's, it actually seems like a perfect use case uh, right. for, for that. Uh, uh, just um, moving to the other part, you know, of the platform, of the marketplace. I must confess, before I ask you this question, Rajiv, that I'm a super buyer on Amazon, okay, right. both in India and in the UK. How do you think this tech, ML, generative AI, help buyers like me, what are you doing in, in, in that area, if anything? Yeah. yeah, and here again, I'll give you some examples that are India specific. Mm -hmm. India has over 750 million internet users, mm -hmm. maybe even 800 million now, because it just continues to go up. But a large majority of these users, again, are have low digital maturity. They're new to internet, uh, online shopping, and so on. In fact, in user studies, we've got feedback from these users that they find our product pages difficult to navigate. So one of the things we did last uh, a year or two years ago, we started an effort where we wanted to use ML to predict the proficiency of each user. Okay. I see. And in India, you have a very diverse uh, user base. You know, there may be people like us who are mm. proficient with using online shopping, but there are a lot of the first-time users who are just getting on to the internet, who really don't understand the paradigms of search and how shopping on uh, on the web uh, works. And so we, you know, use the user session information. Okay. What are the what are the actions users are performing? while they are on our website, you know, uh, number of search queries that they're issuing. You can imagine that number of search queries is a good indicator of mm. uh, customer proficiency, right? So we use machine learning to predict how proficient you are, okay, in real time, wow. based on your activity uh, during the session. And, and we use that signal, that customer proficiency signal to then rank widgets on our web pages, okay? And customize the web page to your proficiency. So for example, if you're a new user, we will have help 
content, tutorials. We will have more, uh, you know, give you the choice of language because mm -hmm. we have content in multiple different languages. And if you're a high proficient, you know, highly proficient user, then we will show you ads, we'll show you subscribe and save, other sign up widgets and so on. These are more advanced features on, on Amazon, right? That we even rolled it out to other marketplaces where it gave an amazing impact. Another example is, you know, we use machine learning to identify uh, pairs of substitute. For example, you know, there may be two laptops mm -hmm. of different brands which have similar specs. specs. And mm -hmm. so you could substitute one for the mm -hmm. other. And we use this information to recommend a substitute product if a given product is out of stock. I see. Or let's say if one product may take a couple of days to be shipped to you while uh, another product will be shipped to you on the same day or the next day, then we will also recommend to you a substitute that you could get faster. Yeah, yeah. And we use, uh, you know, clearly uh, substitute products have similar titles, they have similar images, mm -hmm. but there's another very interesting signal that we have on our website that helps us identify substitutes, which is the behavior of customers. So when you're buying a product, you actually browse through and you view a lot of other substitute products mm. and you purchase only one of them. Yes. Right? So if a pair of products is co-viewed a lot frequently, but only one of them gets purchased, then we, you know that the, this pair of products is a pair of substitutes and, and we leverage that information. And a third example that I'll give is around in, in the area of search. One thing that we've seen in India is customers have very strong regional preference. And if you look at a customer in Gujarat searching for a sari, the sari that they may be interested in, uh, be maybe a, like uh, a bandhani or something yeah, yeah, yeah. of that uh, type compared to a customer in Karnataka searching the, for a sari again, sh uh, that customer may be more interested in a Mysore silk. Okay. So we include the regional popularity of a product as a feature in the search algorithms. So our ranking algorithms tend to surface regionally popular and regionally relevant products. So that's another example of how we are using machine learning to improve the customer experience. But we also try to make the shopping experience more productive for customers. So for example, a lot of customers will have search queries on Amazon with mm -hmm. a very broad intent. Mm -hmm. so people search for, let's say, laptops. Laptop, yeah. Or they'll search for Mobile saris, phone. <laughs> yeah. Mobile phone. Yeah. It's a very broad intent. Yeah. And of course, you know, Amazon, we have huge amount of selection. So you're gonna get thousands of results when you type for something like sari and so on. And it, it is a problem for customers, like how do I decide what to buy, right? So one of the things, again, innovations here is we surface some filters mm -hmm. uh, to customers. And again, those v filters that are recommended to customers, we call them refinement suggestions because you helps you re refine your search results. They are all surfaced based on machine learning. And it's also personalized, this customer probably cares more about color or more about the material of the product. So th you get a refinement saying, okay, do you want to uh, filter these search results based on the color of the sari, right? So uh, somebody may be only interested in blue sari. Yep. And you may be interested in the material. You may want cotton saris. So for you, you'd get a refinement saying, do you want to filter and refine these search results based on the material, right? And cotton w would be something that you would select. Yeah. So this is again another way of helping customers really narrow down the uh, products that we show them, which sometimes can be quite overwhelming. You know, I so identify with this because to get the kind of right green shoes in the right. kind of material I wanted, etc. Uh, you know, so I think those attributes and those filters really, really help me. Yeah. I just want to switch gears a little bit here, uh, Raju, sure. and look a little bit more into the future. If I could tease out a few things that you guys are working on, both from a seller as well as a 
buyer or even a logistics standpoint which make these constituencies excited plus also some of the people who are going to join you the fresh right. MLAI engineers etc what can they look forward to yeah. what is the kind of new stuff happening you know like one of the uh, initiatives that I'm super excited about is uh, on um, grading uh -huh. the quality of fresh produce fruits and vegetables oh, wow. and using uh, computer machine vision. Mm. Uh, computer vision and mm. machine learning mm. to uh, identify defects and so on. We have a grocery business uh, and uh, quality as you know is one of the most important drivers of fresh fruit and vegetable purchases, right? In fact, it's the number one driver of repeat purchases by mm. customers. You could have humans examine manually the quality of each individual fruit and vegetable and that's clearly not going to scale, right? So two years ago, we started an effort to use computer vision to automate, automate that process. Essentially, look at product images and then identify defects such as cuts, cracks, pressure damage and so on for uh, produce like, you know, uh, uh, tomatoes, onions, uh, sweet lemon, capsicum. So we've, we've covered a number of such uh, uh, fruits and vegetables. And what we have done is we've put uh, really cheap IoT cameras wow. on top of grocery shelves, okay? And these are then monitoring the fruits and vegetables uh, underneath. And the images get sent to the cloud where they're graded. And then an alert goes to the store to go and cull the produce that has defects, right? So this is something that we've deployed in um, multiple stores in India and we're expanding the footprint. And uh, it, it's a very exciting application of computer vision. I can see your, you know, it's the whole, you started with saying there was science and then there's this engineering or the application. And I can see how, how you started in Bell Labs from the science bit and now how it has come right. into the application bit. In fact, I would think that this would have great impact on the overall national food supply chain also, Absolutely. right? I mean, you could use it in so many different, uh, different ways there. Yeah. Uh, in fact, on that queue itself, uh, Rajiv, you obviously are a leader at Amazon, but other than that, you are a leader in, in, in this technology also. And what do you see, you know, what are the things that you see in the next few months, years, you yeah. know, uh, which are going to happen? Customers like you will have personal assistants Mm -hmm. helping you with your shopping mission. Uh, just like we have a personal digital assistant for sellers mm -hmm. that's helping sellers with Fantastic. listing products, answering their questions about how do I grow my business, how do I comply with laws, uh, you know, what do I need to list a product and so on. I think on the customer side also, there will be personal digital assistants that will answer product related questions that customers have, right? like what is SSD, for example, right? A lot of customers may not know what SSD is and uh, also guide the customers to the product that they're looking to buy. For example, again, you say, I want to buy a laptop, you know, your assistant will come and say, just like an offline shopkeeper, mm -hmm. what do you want to use the laptop for? Sure, do you want to sure. use it, but do you want it for your child uh, in school? Do you want it for uh, your office? That would be a different laptop. Uh, versus a laptop for gaming. The assistant will exactly replicate the same behavior, right? Mm -hmm. Which is like, mm -hmm. ask you, is there a specific brand preference? Do you have a price preference? And help you make the buying decision. So the, mm -hmm. all those are possibilities in the future. You're going to see that mm -hmm. happen more and more. Uh, and LLMs will power that. Guiding customers, answering questions. Guiding sellers, answering questions. That's one. Those are some buckets of applications. I think you'll also see a lot of, uh, on the video and the image side, mm -hmm. very expensive for sellers to drape curtains and take pictures, nice high quality pictures, mm. and list them, right? Because it takes a worker to take the curtain, put it on a window, drape it. You need a photographer who will take the picture and so on. With generative AI, the seller could just take an image of the curtain material absolutely and just send you like a hundred such curtain snapshot the color and the material just take a picture and then generative ai could actually generate an image 
of what this curtain material, if draped on a on a window, would look, look like, like. Wow. right? So your product images suddenly become like the seller. All the seller has to do is take a few images and. Generative AI does all the work. The future, maybe this interview would be generated. <laughs> you never know. Uh, well, like uh, you never we know have a big setup here today yeah. for this. You never know <laughs> whether even this is uh, in a setup. And you and generated. me won't be here. There may be like <laughs> chatbots. But uh, we also have products, uh, videos. India is a video-loving nation. We yes. love our videos and so on. We have launched product videos on our product pages, yes. Yes. and the videos. Are, were initially manually generated and uh, again it was very expensive it was almost I think sixty dollars a video or something and uh, now we use Gen AI to generate videos you know Fantastic. we look at the product page we have a lot of information we pick out the key highlights all using ML we generate voice scripts entire voice scripts using uh, large language models and Gen AI. We then uh, stitch them up with relevant product images, the script, and we also put on top a human presenter, which is again an AI generated human presenter who narrates the whole uh, you know, voice script with face gestures, hand uh, movements, and uh, uh, with the lips syncing completely wow. with the voice, all automatically generated. You know, with all this amazing action happening in AI ML space, I sometimes want to be go back 30 years again and want to be young again because this this whole horizon of you know amazing things to learn to do. But on the other hand, with so much action happening, sometimes it gets confusing, right? And so, if there was a young person, you know, in their 20s or uh, early mid 20s, what advice would you give her as to how to become a great AI, ML uh, engineer, and what kind of work they should be learning and working on to prepare for the future. Right. I agree with you. AI and ML are super exciting, ex especially uh, you know, with LLMs and Gen AI. Uh, it has taken up uh, AI uh, to you know, a couple of notches up, for sure. You know, a lot of learning today is self-learning. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. there are there's a lot of content on the internet around large language models, how chat GPT works, uh, and there are so many other LLMs out there mm -hmm. uh, from Google, from Facebook, and many other companies, uh, Claude from Anthropic, and there are there's a lot of material uh, and course content from Coursera, Udacity, people, youngsters can take to educate themselves. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So I would say take some of the online courses, build up your knowledge how uh, these ML systems work, the internals, because sometimes the knowledge of the internals is useful mm -hmm. for, to get the best performance out of these technologies. There's also Kaggle websites where they have competitions and that's a good thing for youngsters to participate in, to hone their practical hands-on uh, skills, right, of building ML models. On these sites, the, there's also a lot of discussion on, on the tricks one can do to get the best performance from the ML models. So I would say, you know, leverage the internet and of course companies like Amazon have uh, machine learning uh, summer schools I or see. machine learning uh, universities uh, that we offer courses. Um, uh, and a lot of these courses are free for uh, students. In fact, in India, we offer the ML Summer School uh, to over 3,000 students every year who can, oh. who can take it virtually. So I think uh, avail of these opportunities by companies that are offering free courses on ML. And there we also talk about the kinds of applications uh, that we're using ML for. So you learn even the practical aspects of machine learning. And finally, I'd say, you know, go back to school. If, uh, get a master's. <laughs> like I did. Uh, yeah, get a master's in uh, machine learning and AI. I think it's, uh, education is always valuable. Building up the skills by attending school uh, is also an avenue for some people. But, you know, self-learning also can be pretty powerful. No, I think I agree that this hybrid model of self-learning 
plus formal learning. I don't think only one of the two works in today's world. Right. And we need both of them to, to really develop the skills in such a fast changing uh, environment. Right, absolutely. Sounds good. Jeffrey Hinton, as you know, besides being the father of deep learning, has also until recently been a, a conservative voice, you know, on AI, right. especially AGI, artificial general intelligence singularity. But recently, after all this large language models, etc., he was asked, you know, what he thought of when AGI will happen. And he said, earlier on, I used to think 30 to 50 years. Now I think 10 to 20. And then when the interviewer asked him, that uh, can it happen in five years? The true engineer that he is, he said, yes, there's a non-zero probability right. that it can. So let me ask you that question. You know, with your great experience in machine learning and AI, and now with all this talk of Q-star and singularity and AGI, yeah. if you were to look in your crystal ball, what do you, what do you think? You know, those are those emergent abilities of common sense reasoning and understanding natural language, understanding and comprehension clearly are being exhibited, right? But there, at the same time, there is also like hallucination mm -hmm. that things being made up, some of the offensive stuff yes. that, is, that comes up and so on. It's sort of possible in five years, these systems <laughs> would really, really overcome some of the signs that they don't have intelligence, right? It still requires work. I mean, it's very difficult to predict. Even this seems quite unbelievable. Absolutely. To be honest. As human beings also, I think sometimes we do very stupid things and we do very intelligent things. So, right. you know, I yeah. think there's a lot of uh, similarity in a sense in large language models. I recently read a wonderful quote on the hallucination part, which uh, Mark Anderson uh, said. He said that, look, when we, li when we don't like it, we call it hallucination. When we like it, we call it creativity. Right. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. uh, uh, on that note, Rajiv, it was, it was amazing talking to you. This conversation can go on for a few more hours because of our shared interests in sure. this area. But thank you so much for your time yeah. and uh, uh, sharing your insights on AI, ML, and the future in that. Yeah, thanks for the amazing conversation. It was really uh, a great discussion, and thanks a lot for that. Lovely. Yeah. Thank you.